We are, um, we are in a new, we're kicking off a new series um, this week um, called Relate. Everybody say Relate. And the whole premise of the series is restoring and expanding relationships. Restoring and expanding relationships. As we talk about expanding, we have to understand that relationships are some of the are the most one of the most important thing um, for us. Whether we talk about our divine relationship or either our human relationships, um, and so uh, we, we're going to talk about that. I want to just give this uh, this special observation in the back of your uh, in the seat. In front of you, um, you should uh, you should see one of these. Um, it was called March Madness. How many of us like NCAA basketball? Awesome, awesome. Well, we're not doing a bracket necessarily, but uh, so I didn't want people to get too too excited about that. March Madness is this big push um, in March uh, where is is basketball, college basketball games going on everywhere. We're going to use that slogan um, for our Relate series. And so we call it March Madness. It's going to extend a little bit beyond March. Um, this is what we hope to do. In order to restore and expand our relationships, it's not just a sermon series. We believe the word that God speaks in here is meant to put our feet in action. Did y'all hear me? The word that God speaks in here is meant to put our feet in action, not just meant to hear it. And so this is what we want to do. We want to ensure relationships um, in this church continue to uh, restore and expand. Um, As we have birthed two two services and as the church has grown, uh, we hope that people do do not get segmented into little cliques and posses or either little groupings without knowing other people. Also, too, we don't want people to come in, um, sit by themselves every week, and nobody greet them or even know what's going on in their lives. We want people to feel welcome. When we say welcome home, when I go home, everybody's home might not be like this, but when I go home, anybody in the house at that time is treated like what? Family. Even if it's their first time. Now, when we say treated like family, you still got to get some warm up. There's certain things you still don't get the benefits of. But but we treat you like family. We want you to be loved, and we want that to be what we do. We don't want to say things and say, this is who we are, and we don't do anything. That's, that's, that's bad. That's called, that's called hypocrisy, and we don't, want, we don't want to be named of that. And so we want to connect. Uh, we want to connect with different people. Um, and so there's three words that we, uh, that we strive to model here at uh, Divine Union Community Church. Uh, call, connect, and commit. It. Um, and I'm just reading this off the paper. Um, this is a church-wide challenge to connect with new people throughout our church and community to intentionally get to know one another. As our church grows and as we embrace multiple services, it is very, it is very easy and tempting to make small pockets of people um, that we connect with. This is meant to challenge some and free others to talk and connect with new people remember divine unity isn't simply our name it's our mission um so things to cover and so practically what this would look like um when you get with we want you to get with people for lunch share a meal um meet somebody um at the gun range uh, uh, meet somebody at the basketball court at the gym um, ask somebody where they filing their taxes and if their return was bigger than what you wanted bigger than yours ask them where they got that from and go with them there I mean just I mean, see people 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 relate that you know um you know if you you know ladies you know y'all like to get your hair done get your nails done or something invite somebody to come along with them I ain't saying you got to pay for them but if you if it's on your heart, go ahead and do it. But, but just, just, just invite somebody to do something that you like doing. You hear it? I'm giving you the, t- the chance to be selfish and selfless all at the same time. So invite somebody to do something that you like doing, okay? I like watching movies, and I like going out to eat, and I like going to the gym. So that's where most of my relationships are built, around movies, gym, oh, church. That's the other thing. I like that. <laughs> oh, church is very important. Uh, <laughs> People be looking for me. They're like, Chris, where you at? I'm, I'm at church. Do you live there? No, but I'm there a lot. Um, and so, you know, but, but really just what, what's the practical thing that you like doing? And invite somebody to join along. And it doesn't have to just be over a meal. It could be over several things. And look, for those of y'all that's on social media, how many of us on social media? Uh, that could be Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter. Uh, <laughs> uh, all those things. And so this is what... This one, want you to do, okay? Let me see, let me see a phone real quick. Let me, I want to use the iPhone 6 Plus. <laughs> Thing big. Um, and, and when you go, when you get with somebody, come here, Cor, with this, this thing called, um, what, what do y'all call it when you take a picture? Like, selfie. selfie. Yes. We want to do relate selfies. And so me and Cor, what we just finished doing, Cor? I'm saying, no, what, yeah, what, what we do? We, we, we went somewhere. 
we went to see a musical, okay? It was Cinderella and Skyline, okay? And so, um, so current, right? And so I'm like, hey! So then we take the picture, right? Boy, smiling and stuff. He made me look better in the picture, so it's a benefit for me right there. And so uh, I told you, look, I'm a little selfish there. It's okay. Thank you for for being trendy. And so we took our picture. You posted on so on social media and say, uh, what's the, what's up here? Duck Has, life. Yeah. Hashtag duck life. Hashtag duck relate. And we want to spread the word and show uh, show the world, social media world, as other people. Hey, that we are relating with one another. And so with somebody that you don't know at the church, and here's the thing, some of the conversations that you have may be awkward for the first 20 minutes. Okay, I don't want anybody to be confused about that. I mean, hey, your name, okay. What's your birthday? What you like to eat? And so we gave you some things to cover to be intentional. Thank you, Gore. Um, and so things to cover. Um, look, um, you can you can make up an icebreaker if you want. And because if, especially when somebody else is doing the same thing, y'all can be awkward together. Um I'm telling you, man, holy awkwardness is what helped us. Okay, anyway, so icebreaker. Um, talk about your conversion experience, um, your testimony of your Christian journey, pivotal moments in life, um, or either um, what does meaningful relationships mean to you? How did you first connect with God? What um, what are your pa what are you passionate about? And how can I pray for you? And so you do these, so you do these things, um, so you do these things, and, and you ask these questions. And here's the thing: if the person doesn't go to duck, if the person's not involved in church, it's a great evangelism opportunity, and you can ask them all the same question. You get it? So when did you give your life to the Lord? I, I haven't. Good. <laughs> you, you, you see, thank you. Some people got it. Other people like, but that's you. You didn't ask the right question. No, you asked a very good question. Because now they have to answer. When, what was your conversion experience? What does faith mean to you? And make it simple. You, ain't, you don't even have to have all the right answers. We just want to create the space for the Holy Spirit to speak to us and through us to the other people. So relate. Everybody say relate. Um, and so that's the practical side. I didn't want to get to preaching and then didn't say that. And then people were like, well, how am I supposed to do it? And so that's one big way there. Okay. Um, sweet. All right. So we're going we're gonna to jump in. Uh, we're going to jump in um, to today's message. Um, Ephesians chapter 1. Um, this is 3 through 12. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through 12. Um, it is in the New Testament. Um, if you see Revelation, you got to back it up. Um, if you if you see Matthew, keep on going. And it's somewhere within these 13 letters that Paul wrote. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 12. And um, and actually, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, uh, we're not going to read all this. I changed my mind. We're going to read, uh, we're just going to read verse 3, okay? All right, let us stand to our feet. <laughs> I battled with it, and then I just remembered this is, this is the main thing I want to read. And we're going to cover the other stuff, though, okay? Uh, is that a deal? Y'all cool with that? Oh, all right, cool. Everybody's like, I ain't got to stand up as long. Good. So uh, Ephesians chapter 1, starting at verse 3. This is the New King James Version, and we uh, do believe participation is better than? And so we're going to read together. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Let's read it again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly place in Christ. Amen. May the Lord add a rich blessing to the reading of his word. If I could use for a title, topic, subject, or focus, it would be, we are rich. Look at somebody beside you and say, I am, I am rich. rich. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for who you are. We ask that you be with us as we study your word, cover this word, let it change our perspective of our, in our relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may be seated. We are rich. Um, as, you, as we kick off this series, what you'll find um, is that as we talk about relating, um, we're going to use the book of uh, Ephesians, the letter that Paul wrote to the, uh, to, the, to the church of Ephesus, as a backdrop. So it's not quite a series on Ephesians, but we're using it. So um, and when we look at our graphic, all of these icons are aspect, or either are sermons that we're going to cover throughout the sermon series. So that's pretty exciting. And so as we talk about um, relating, uh, I want to just take a moment to ask you um, to imagine or either to reflect or either to think um, about your top three relationships. Take a moment. What, who are you in relationship with your top three relationships? And you don't even have to do people favors. If they're not in your top three, they don't, they're not in your mind right now. Just excuse them. Um, 
When you're in your top three relationships, top three relationships, now I want you to think, what makes those relationships special? What are the elements that make those relationships special? So when we look at these relationships, what are some of those things that make them special? Um, so in some of those things, um, matter of fact, let's throw a couple of them out. Um, what's some of the things that you thought about that make the relationship special? Honesty. Come on. Participation. Unconditional acceptance. Unique. Unique. Encouragement. Fun. Communication. Safe space. Commonality. Give me two more. Time? You, right, good. What else? I need one more. Respect. See, all these things that we quickly named off, um, a couple things that I think about too, uh, and some of them will be reiteration. Um, things like trust is big. Um, honesty is huge. Um, admiration, acceptance, availability, time, um, consistency, values, and love. These are what, the, the things that you name and some of the things that I name are what we call relationship necessities. And I don't know about you, but I count relationships very high in my life. I don't ask for everybody to be in relationship with me. But those that are in relationship with me, it's a, it's a big price to pay. And I tell people, if you're going to be my friend, that's a lot of friend to be. You hear me? Like, I don't, you're not just going to call me friend and think you're going to get away with not being honest and get away with not being trustworthy and get away with ignoring my phone call. If you call me friend, this means you're going to pick up my call anytime I call you. If you don't pick it up, I'm going to give you the double call. Y'all know the double call. <laughs> Did you just ignore me? Let me show. <laughs> it's important when I get a double call. When I get the double call, I, don't, I can, I, hey, excuse me. And certain people, and I tell them, I said, be careful when you double call me. I had to rebuke one of my friends, don't double call me if it's not important. Because yeah. he double called me. I, I walked out of a meeting. I said, excuse me. What's up? Yeah, man, I was just saying what you said. Man, don't you double call me like that, man. <laughs> man, you know I love you now, all right? I'm going to call you back. <laughs> we got to get some people right because you love them. And so these relationship necessities, these things are values that translate really no matter the relationship. You want these values to be there whether it's you and your boss, whether it's you and your spouse, you and a, you and a sibling, you and a parent, you and, you and the person that's standing in line behind you in Walmart. You see, we don't think about it, but we want to be able to trust that person that they won't steal our groceries. <laughs> Or they won't bump, or they won't tear our Achilles with their, with their basket. Anybody else had that paranoid moment? It's like they're moving real fast behind me. I'm about to get real ended. This is not going to be good. And they catch me in stride, I might go down. And, and, and so we want, but in other words, it, it's crazy. The things that we named to be necessities in relationship ultimately show that we want to be able to relate with people in general in a way that is safe. And so as we talk about um, these relationship necessities, um, one thing that I look at is so many times in our culture, our culture is developed to literally destroy relationships. Um, if you look at some of the relationship breakers or the relationship killers, these things, and you probably got a ton of things, and, and, but some of the things, selfishness, greed, deception, manipulation, jealousy, or either having, a, ha having an offense, these things literally kill or either drain relationships. Matter of fact, when you look at, when you look at the, the anonyms to everything that we said for the things that we need in relationships, when those things happen, sometimes we create a little distance. Am I by myself? And, and here's the thing, as much as I want to show mercy and grace, I can't keep holding my heart out there for you to keep on piercing it with deception, with selfishness, with greed, and not answer my double tap call. Like, you know, but these things drain relationships. And so as we look at our society, as we look at divorce rates increase, as we look at, um, as we look at um, uh, uh, really not just divorce rates, but when we look at even the faculty or the, the institution of marriage and how poorly it has been uh, uh, upheld or either how much it has been attacked, it's, that's two things. Some people didn't uphold it. Some people were attacked in it. You see that one of the most meaningful earthly relationships is under attack 
Now, understand this. Sin manifested itself in separation of relationship. When, when Adam and Eve sinned, the manifestation of their sin was a separation of relationship between them and God. And so the manifestation of sin is disconnection. Okay, I want to make sure we get that. The manifestation of sin is what? Disconnection. And so what we find is that broken relationship is the result of sin, but we also see the manifestation of salvation is restored relationship. And so sin breaks relationship, but salvation restores relationship. And don't you see, even when Jesus was speaking to us, he said something like this. If you have an art against your brother, you leave the altar and go handle that because salvation restores relationship. Understand that even God in the Ten Commandments, uh, the, the last five was about us being able to restore relationship because relationship is needed for humanity. Understand if a, if a baby, um, part of the baby's development is human touch, is that relationship. And we can go into some of the psychological aspects of the brain. And when we talk about their mirror neurons, they connect with people, able to interpret their intentions, but they literally need human contact. In order to develop, a baby can be fed and, 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 can, and, and can be changed on a, on a decent schedule, but without human contact, it literally slows down their development. It literally slows down their development. You'll see their speech may lag. You'll see their ability to connect with other people or either think outside of themselves. That stuff will begin to lag. And so many times, the relationships in this culture, whether it's parenting, whether it's spousal, whether it's friendship, it begins to draw a disconnection that hinders our development. And so when it comes to relating to God, what happens? We feel a lack of connection and a lack of relationship. And so as, 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 as Paul writes to the church of Ephesus, it's really cool when we talk about the church of Ephesus, it's a very relational book. When I say very relational, most of the letters that Paul wrote was in response to people acting up and asking crazy questions. Like they would say stuff like, hey, Paul, you know, my dad and his, and his, and his, uh, his new wife, she ain't my mama. Like they, don't, they ain't together no more. I, I should marry her, right? No, you should not. They would just say stuff like, I mean, it's okay if I sleep with a prostitute. Like, I mean, that's like, that's like any other sin. No, any sin that's committed sexually, it, it, it causes something internally. All right, well, that, yeah, that was stupid. Okay, I'm sorry. Now, now, Paul, listen. Now, look, these gents, they're coming up here. You know, we some good Jews. I can't believe they don't come up here and try to worship with us like they the children of Abraham. No, they have been adopted just like you. Okay, okay, okay. And so what we see is when Paul wrote the letters, he would respond to the questions and issues. But when he wrote to the church of Ephesus, he, he was responding out of overflow of gratitude and pastoral care. And so we see some of the most sound advice to Christian living and church building in the church of Ephesus. Some philosophers or the commentators even say that Ephesians is a case study on how to build a Christian community in an urban environment. And even when you look at it, more New Testament writers wrote about the church of Ephesus than any other church. So when you look in, when you look in the book of Acts, the, the, the author was Luke. He talked about the riot that Paul caused when he began to convert people. Literally, they flipped the city upside down and they, and they caused a riot to the point when Paul was arrested, the people that, that, that had formerly arrested him began to come to the Lord. And so it went from one of the most disconnected places to one of the most relational places, all because Paul cared. So when we get to the church of Ephesus, one, um, th I, I want to I make sure, I think um, this statement here kind of captures what the church of Ephesus is. One commentator said this, he says, uh, he says, Ephesians is addressed to a group of believers who are rich beyond measure in Jesus Christ, yet living as beggars and only because they are ignorant of their wealth. It's addressed to a group of believers that are rich beyond measure, but living as beggars. You know, that's just like having, having unlimited resources in your bank account, but you're still living in poverty because you're unaware of the resources. The difference between the beggar in Christ and the rich in Christ is an awareness of the resources that are available. That's the major difference. I'm not saying that you act better. Hear me. I'm not saying that you're no more. I'm saying, but you're aware that there are unlimited resources. And when you're aware that there's unlimited resources, it gives you a different type of confidence in it. 
And so as Paul writes to the church of Ephesus, he builds it theologically first that your most important relationship is your relationship with God, number one. That's your most important relationship. Everybody say relate Relate. with God. And so as we go, before we talk about marriage, before we talk about our vocation, before we talk about spiritual warfare and the others, the first one is we need to remember how or be revealed to how to relate to God. Because until you can relate to God, it's going to be very difficult to relate to people. And so this is what helps us translate. And so when we look at, so when we look at what Paul writes, I'm going to do, and, and I'm going to do a bird's eye view of Ephesians 1 through 3. Are y'all ready for this? Um, And so when we look at this, in order for us to relate to God rightly, one, we must understand God's desire. And God's desire is to give us more than we could ever ask for. God's desire is to give us more than we could ever ask for. God's desire is to give us more than we could ever ask for. Ephesians 1.3, he says this. um, Can we pull that up? Ephesians 1.3, he says this. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus who has blessed us with every what? Okay, everybody else look up at the screen. He has blessed us with what? Every spiritual blessing. That E word is key. Every spiritual blessing he has blessed us with. And so when we come to this, the first thing is that God desires to give us more than we could ever ask. Now, oftentimes we we fail or either misunderstand the benefits of being a believer. Um, we could be, sometimes we could be super spiritual, like, yeah, you know, I'm just so blessed. And we could be optimistic. There's a difference in holy confidence and optimism. Optimism sometimes deny real, denies reality. But a holy confidence recognizes truth in the midst of reality. There's a difference be- be- between divine confidence and optimism. And so when Paul opens up in Ephesians 1, 3, he says this, this statement that, that he, then he goes on to the longest run-on run sentence that's recorded almost in the Bible from Ephesians 1.3 all the way to about Ephesians um, 1, 1.23. And he just keeps on going, laying it on. But in order to move them from being beggars in Christ to, rich, to, to being rich in Christ, he says this is, a, this is a statement you have to understand. The God, our Father... The Father, Lord Jesus Christ, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Key thing, past tense, he has blessed us. This does not mean that you have to work for it. He has already made it available to us. Whether you have received it or not is the only question. It's already been made available. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Not every material blessing, not every physical blessing, but every spiritual blessing. And so then Paul goes on from this point to name about six things that we're going to cover very quick in this that show us what the spiritual blessings are. One, and when we go when we go to the next when we go to the next verse in verse 4 he says just as just as he who chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestined us verse 5 having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ everybody say adoption and so the first spiritual blessing is adoption the second one is acceptance and we're going to keep on through them but adoption he says that we have been predestined to be adopted let me show you something here there's three ways to enter into a family one birth you're born in can't deny that you're a part of that family even if you don't want to be amen (laughs) um so you're born into the family two marriage when you get married the two become one but um also the families become united as well Um, So now, Sherelle is no longer known as Sherelle Walden. She is Sherelle Johnson. If somebody calls her Sherelle Walden, they get dealt with. Because they're disrespecting the family. Now, um, (laughs) and and so now she bears my last name, right? Um, And and so, and so, so, so you got birth, and you got marriage, and the other way is adoption. And when we look at adoption, adoption means to take one that formerly was not yours as your own. Now, as far as if the name change or not, it can, but that's the beauty of adoption. So the first spiritual blessing is this, that he has chosen us to be a part of his family. And to be chosen to be a part of his family, he reiterates it. Jesus writes it, and when Jesus speaks it, in John 15, he says, you did not choose me, I chose you. You didn't choose me. You didn't make this beautiful declaration. Oh, yeah, I'm going to choose the Lord. No, he says, I chose you. 
before the foundations of the world. I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. I chose you even then. Before you were born, when you were born into sin and shaped into iniquity, I still chose you. And I proved it by dying on the cross that I still chose you. Because if I wanted to deny you, I would have just let you die and spend eternity and, and spend eternity in hell. But I chose you. Now, that should change how we relate with everything, but especially with God, because he invites you to be a part of his family. And so one, one, one person said it like this, that, that there's, there's different types of rules. Like you got club rules. Club rules is that you abide by these rules in order to be a part of the club or the organization, right? Um, that's, those are club rules. Like so if you want to be a part of this, you have to do boom, 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 right? You know, you got to wear two left shoes for five days, and then you wear a different color sock with a different color T-shirt. Then you're part of this club. Like those are those rules. Like you got to do it to be accepted. Y'all got the club rules. You have to do these rules to be accepted. But then you got like HOA rules, uh, housing, like, uh, not HOA, like housing, what's the people that? Homeowners Association, right. Homeowners Association. Then you got those rules. And, and, and you don't really know what those rules are until they leave a nasty note on your door, right? Until you break them. Until you break them, all of a sudden, they're like, you cannot do X, Y, and Z. And you never really know who it is unless you want it. It's like the mob, right? Uh, it's like, you don't, you don't want to do that. And, so, uh, and so, but, so those are a set of rules that you don't know until you break them. But then you got family rules. These rules exist because you're a part of it. And so when God gave the Ten Commandments to the children of Israel, he says these are not requirements, but these are confirmations that you're a part of my family. And so many times we look at the rules of God as requirement instead of confirmation. And so when you recognize he has adopted you, when he gives you the set of rules, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments, you say, yes, I'm part of your family, and therefore I will follow the rules. People that fail to follow the rules of God fail to recognize their family with God. So this is why Jesus says, hey, pray like this, our Father, because I want you to understand the rules are confirmation that you're a part of the family. Everybody say, I'm adopted. And so when we look at this idea of being adopted, he says, look, I have adopted you as sons or as daughters by Jesus Christ to, to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Just hear the richness in this according to his good pleasure. This means he takes pleasure in getting us out of our orphanage. He takes pleasure out of adopting us out of our situation. He takes pleasure for showing up like nobody else can. Y'all I mean, should be a little bit more excited than that. Come on, I know it's daylight saving time, but we need to go ahead and get ready for what God is doing in our lives. And so here's the thing, you're missing it, then you'll still be looking for somebody else to adopt you. But when you have been adopted by God, Romans 8.15 says you did not receive a spirit of orphan, of, of the orphan, but the spirit of adoption. You, you, you asked me to be a part of your family. God, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. And because I've been adopted, I'm saying, God, what, 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 what's the rules? What, what, what lets me know that I'm a part of your family? Quick story. When we talk about family rules, y'all ever had the situation when everybody else was doing something in the neighborhood or either all your friends and they had, um, they had something that you wanted? They said, well, look, they got it. And said, well, do they live here? That's how your parents are. Well, do they, do they, do they, do I feed them? Huh? Do I pay their bills? Huh? Did they come out of my womb? Huh? Right. And so they start laying on because they're saying the reason why I said what I said was to confirm that you're part of me. And so the first spiritual blessing, this is what people beg for relationship, but they don't realize they've been adopted. Because you walk around like an orphan still seeking approval from everybody. So instead of trying to please the people that hate you, please the God that made you. Verse 6, <laughs> he says, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he has made us what? Accepted. Y'all see this purple? Let me help you. He has made us accepted. Everybody say accepted. In the beloved. And so when we look at this right here, the second spiritual blessing, which we can miss sometimes, is um, he, he says that you're adopted, but he also says that you're accepted. <laughs> now, now, here's the thing. You can be adopted and not be accepted, and then they can treat you wrong because they don't really look at you like you're really part of the family. Like, you really weren't born of us. Your nose ain't shaped like ours. You just adopted. But he says, in case somebody missed it, not only did I adopt you, but I accepted you the way you are, and then by you being a part of this family, you'll begin to exemplify the same values. 
So he says you are accepted. One of the greatest human desires is to be accepted. Every human being is born with the desire to be accepted. The more Chloe grows into consciousness of what's right and wrong to mommy and daddy, when she does something, she already knows, I'm sorry, mommy. I'm sorry, dad. Because in her is the, is the desire to simply be accepted. And we say, thank you for your apology. But you are always our daughter. No matter how you feel, you're always our daughter. Thank you for the apology. That's respect. But you are still accepted. You are not deselected from the family because you messed up. And so when I've been accepted by God, I live my life out of the overflow that I've already been accepted. Therefore, it gives me more capacity to do what? Accept other people as well. And when you can't accept other people, sometimes because you don't feel accepted. That's the greatest human desire. You know people do all types of things to be accepted. I love quoting the great philosopher, borderline prophet, Tupac Shakur. He says, I've never had a place to rest till I got this thug life planted on my chest. In other words, he found himself living this thug life, baby, I'm hopeless, because he was looking to be accepted. That's it. People, people, you know, I look at, you know, I, I, I marvel. I marvel at organized crime. Y'all, follow me, follow me, okay? I marvel at organized crime because in organized crime, the thing that they build their premise off of is that we're family. And once you come in, you have to die to get out. <laughs> so you might get in. You can even be quiet about your affiliation, but you can never not be a part of it. But we don't do the same thing in the Christian body. We just let people go on willingly. And here's the thing. Hear me. I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it clear. Okay? I don't believe it should just be so easy for us to say, oh, yeah, we're Christian. I believe it should be accompanied, accompanied with some public declaration, such as confessing with your mouth. And then to believe it in your heart will show how you live. But then they got this thing called baptism. Y'all heard of it? Baptism is a public declaration of an inward commitment. By the way, Good Friday, we're going to be doing baptism here. If you need to get baptized, there you go. But it's a way to say, God, I'm a part of your family. I used this story before, but understand, um, Muslims did not persecute Christians in certain countries until they were baptized because that was their declaration that they was a part of it. When I see in organized crime how they stake claim to take up a block as if it's theirs, they don't pay a dime for it. But this is our territory. My turf, deuce here. Like they, you know, like they, they really, they really take it like it's theirs. And when you have been accepted, it's like you live as if everything that is yours is mine within this thing. And anybody from the outside, no, it is mine. And so a lot of the people that I would consider family, or those, those covenant friends, or those that I would trust my daughter and my wife with, I'm, I'm saying that, that they would be there and they would treat them good as if I was there and I could turn my back. And only that if something was to happen to me, I know that they still would accept it. But we don't, you know, it's a, it's a certain level of dedication that's required of us. Everybody say accept it. All right, let's, let's get it on up. In him, we have redemption through his blood. Redemption. This word right here is a Christian buzzword, but it means so much. To redeem something. You ever had a coupon or either, or either a gift card, right? Uh, or either they say, I, I, I'll use my story. So the, so the church gave me a birthday present, right? And the birthday present, uh, it, was, uh, it was two video games, Xbox 360, 2K15, and Madden. And I love video games. It's another thing I do. Relate to some people. That's how me and Marcus got close and got disconnected and got back close again. <laughs> <laughs> but, but when they gave it to me, understand, neither one of the games were released yet. But it was already pre-ordered and paid for. And so when I walked in the store, I walked with the confidence that it's not in my hand, but it's already mine. And so when you look in your relationship with the Lord and he has redeemed you, you walk with the confidence, hey, it ain't been that great getting up morning yet. He hasn't cracked the sky, but I'm already his. And when I die, he's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And so redemption, redemption means that you have been purchased with a purpose. 
and you have been brought back to now to be owned by something else. And so when it says that when Paul writes to the Corinthians, because they were trying to do all crazy stuff with their body, he says, don't you understand that you was brought with a price and that price was the blood of Jesus? You have been purchased and redeemed to live according to your new owner. And so when you look at it like that, well, I mean, technically he did pay for me, so I'm, I, I got to own up to this. But understand, it's not, it's not that he paid for you just for you to be a slave or a prostitute to Christ. That would be weird. But, but he paid for you because he saw that you were, under, you were under a slave owner that wasn't treating you well. That slave owner was sin. He says, but the way I created you, I created you in my image. I created you to be whole. But sin is destroying you and disconnecting you. You were born into sin and shaped into iniquity. Let me purchase you back. So, I got to use this story real quick on, on, on redemption. It, it's, it talks about this little boy who, who he, he, he worked real hard on building this little model boat. Um, and, and so he worked real hard building this little model boat. And, and then he was so excited. And, and he put it out there in the water. And, 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 and the wind just took it away. And he lost his little boat. And he worked hard on that boat, though. He worked. It was his boat. I mean, his blood, sweat, and tears was in it. That was his boat. Everybody say it was his boat. It was his boat. He made it. He created it in many ways. Like he put it all together. And so the winds and the waves took it away. And so he cried and, and, and he felt, he's like, man, I lost my boat. So he's walking through town and he sees this boat. And he sees this boat in the window of this, of this antique shop. And, and, and the price is marked up. And he looks and he says, that's my boat. He says, that is my boat. So he goes in uh, to the owner. Sir, that's my boat. I lost it. The winds and the waves took it away. That's my boat. He says, well, no, it's mine now. Because I found it. He says, well, what must I do to get my boat? You have to pay for it. So the little boy went and worked hard, sc uh, uh, scratched his pennies together. Uh, he made a dollar out of 15 cents. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Uh, and, 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 and so he got it all together, and he went back in the store. And he says, look, man, here's the money. Give me my boat. And it's crazy that he paid for something that was technically his. But when he walked away, he says, now you're mine twice. And could you imagine seeing Jesus doing the same thing? He's coming and he's looking at our lives and he's looking at you. He says, you're my daughter. You're my son. But the devil is, and sin is looking like, no, they're mine. I found them because they was taken away by the winds and the waves. He says, well, look, how about this? Uh, put me on the cross. Let my blood be shed. Let my body be broken. And now they're mine. Give me my people back. So the beautiful, the beautiful part of redemption is that he's only bringing us back to how he originally created us. Um, then he says, he did it through his blood. He says, the forgiveness of sin. So not only did he get you, but he didn't hold things against you. We don't have to go there alone, but hear this. Sometimes we'll be accepted, adopted, and we'll be redeemed, and all this, but we won't let go of the guilt of our sin. Romans 8, 1, there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Don't let your sin of yesterday keep you from your future in Christ. You hear me? And when you allow God to renew you and forgive you, you'll walk around with the excitement and the pride. I am cleansed. You ever, you ever had a favorite shirt or some type of garment and a stain got on it? And when you washed it, you, go, you check, see if the stain was still there. But because of your favorite shirt, favorite, favorite piece of garment, when it wasn't there, you walked out like the shirt was brand new. And you forgave it of his, first, of his past stain because it had been washed clean. We got to also allow God to do that to our hearts as well. Are y'all with me? Uh, he says, according to, his according to the riches of his grace, according to the riches of his grace. Remember I said we are rich. Paul uses that word rich so often. Uh, in, in Ephesians 1 through 3, according to the riches of his grace, he has he's done these things, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. You know, I almost skipped this one, but when I thought about it, when you have been adopted, accepted, redeemed, and forgiven, wisdom should follow. Here's what I'm saying. Wisdom is the ability to know the difference between right or wrong and choose right. Okay, I want to make sure we get that. It's the ability to know the difference between right and wrong and choose right. To know the difference between right and wrong and still choose wrong is utter stupidity. You got it, okay? You can look that up in Webster's or Google it. You probably won't find it. I just said it. <laughs> All right, give me my shout out. And so to know the difference between right and wrong, I would say is stupidity if you don't choose right. Wisdom, in other words, it keeps us out of stupid stuff. Can I just say it plain? 
Wisdom keeps us out of stupid stuff. One of, one of my favorite pastors, uh, 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 Andy Stanley, he did, a whole, he did a whole sermon series based on wisdom saying this. If you want to look at your current circumstance, if you look at your past, your current circumstance, and your future hopes, what would be the most wise thing to do? He says that's the one question that, you, that would change your life. Looking at your past, your current circumstances, and your future hope, what is the most wise thing to do? And your answer to your situation, according to that question, will most likely keep you out of some crazy stuff. It will keep you out of crazy stuff. Wisdom. Wisdom cries out in the street, but nobody listens, the proverb says. So many people are logically Christian, but they're not wisely Christian. I know this really ain't going to turn out well. Man, but I can uh, really feel it now. I got that feeling. Oh, I got that itch. What is the wise thing to do? Well, I know what is the wise thing to do. But until I choose the wise thing, am I considered wise? This is, what, this is what helps some of us come in with gladness in our heart. We chose the wise thing this week. Yep, chose the wise thing. And some of us, we, we didn't choose the wise thing. We was like, man, how do you know? The Bible is living, powerful, sharp in any two-edged sword. It tells the truth about us. Wisdom. Um, verse 14, verse 13 and 14, it says this. It says, in him you, who you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed. Everybody say sealed. Sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption, the purchased possession, to the praise of his glory. The Holy Spirit serves as the, as the guarantee that everything I just said is going to happen and it is yours. Jesus says, I'm leaving, but I'm going to leave you a comforter. And so he gives us this holy coupon, I should say, that's, that's resting inside of us, but it seals us. And when we are sealed, nothing that, nothing that um, it takes permission for things to go in and things to go out. And when you are sealed, it keeps you fresh. It keeps you fresh. Y'all ever had those chips that you really liked that you didn't seal them right? And last time you ate them, they was crunchy, and this time they were stale? Yep, that's what I'm talking about, sealed. When you are sealed in Christ, he's saying the Holy Spirit will continue to give you wisdom, understanding, in order for you to be who God called you to be. This is God's desire to bless us with every spiritual blessing. I want to drop down. I'm just going to use this part as exhortation. God's desire, God's design. God's design is to give us what we can never get, what we can never earn. God's design is to give us what we can never earn. Can y'all say that with me? God's design is to give us what we can never earn, which kind of puts us in a sense of awe and a sense of humility. All these things we can never earn. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God who is rich, everybody say rich. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace, you have been saved. By grace, you have been saved. When Paul opens up Ephesians chapter 2, he says, And you, he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin. You know, if nothing else turns the fire in you, gets you excited, makes you want to move, it should be the fact that he, you once were dead, but now you are alive. You once we're dead in your trespasses, but now you are alive. Just because breathing happens every so, every so many times in a second, and just because your heart keeps beating, does not mean it's not a miracle. And we can never take for granted the life that we have in Christ. And his design is to give us what we can never earn. I want to point this out to you real quick. He says this, um, he says in Ephesians uh, chapter 2, verse 10, his design, it shows it like this, for we are all his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good work, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. There's a slogan we have in this church. We're a small part of God's big plan. You are a small part of God's big plan. That's his design. You do not deserve to be a part of it. When you read Ephesians chapter 3, starting about verse 8, you'll see Paul says, who am I that I would even have the opportunity to share the gospel? When you look at God's design, you should continuously recognize you are walking and living in things that you can never earn. And when you do that, it keeps you humble. Not keeps you afraid, because you're accepted and you're adopted, but should keep you humble. 
So Paul talks about that. I want to I want to read Ephesians chapter three. And this is what we're going to close with today. So matter of fact, can we all stand up right here? I want to understand this thing here. Until you are satisfied in your relationship with Christ, you will not be satisfied with any other relationship. Until you are satisfied in your relationship with Christ, you will not be satisfied with any other relationship. Paul closed Ephesians chapter 3 with a prayer and an exhortation that continues to renew me but gives me great confidence in my relationship with the Lord. And I want to read this out of the New Living Translation. And we're going to close this sermon with this thing here. Paul, as he, as he begins to read it, he says this, he says, When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow. Oh, sorry, I'm, I skipped something. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, through it, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now, all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work with us, within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Come on, let us give the Lord a great big hand clap of praise there. Come on, let us rejoice in his love towards us. If you're here today and you're thinking, look, my relationship with the Lord is in shambles. I, or either I didn't realize that he had already blessed me with every spiritual blessing. I didn't realize the magnitude. I was a beggar. But now I recognize I should be rich in him. When you, when you, if you want to move from beggar to being rich in Christ today, I don't know your situation. I don't know your struggles. I don't know your emotional instabilities. Well, but I do say this word is a, is, a, is a universal application. If you want to move from beggar to being rich, today is your day to open up your heart and let the love of Christ rule with inside of you. Eyes closed, heads bowed. If that's you today, can you just raise your hand wherever you are? Wherever you are, maybe you want to become, uh, maybe you want to get, maybe you want to say, look, I, I want to be a son or a daughter in Christ, and I don't feel like it. I see the hands lifted, amen. And maybe you're saying, look, I feel like I'm in a deficit in my relationship with the Lord. If that's you, I just want to pray, Father, I ask that you be with them. Open up their hearts and their minds that they might receive everything you have for them. And God, I pray, Ephesians chapter 3, 14 through 21, over them and in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen.